Good evening, everyone. You're all very welcome at our evening harvest service. It's good to see so many people turned in this evening. We hope you do benefit from your time with us this evening. And give a very warm welcome to our guest speaker. I think it's his first time here, the Reverend Robert McClure. You're very welcome, and I look forward to hearing from you in our service this evening. By way of the announcements, can I give a very special thank you to everyone who came along on Friday evening, who supplied all the decorations for our church, and who came along and decorated our church. Thank you for doing that. And I thank Grace and the members of the choir who have singing our special anthems both this morning and this evening. Your contribution is very much appreciated. Also a reminder to you all that there's a cup of tea over in the Hamilton Hall at the close of our service. And can I take this opportunity to thank all those who supplied and who will serve that supper later on this evening, just in case I forget when we're over in the hall. Our thanks is to you now. Those are all the announcements. I just announced that the choir will now lead us with the intro, Love of God. Well, good evening, everyone. <coughs> Thank you for the warm words of welcome from your clerk of session. My name is Robert. I'm from the minister in Second Newton Hamilton uh, and Free Duff. I uh, hope you know who that is. I suppose, in a sense, if you just look out and <coughs> look for the hill in the west, that's Newton Hamilton, in a sense, from one hill to another. Uh, maybe you should twin. Uh, it's great to be here tonight. We had your minister, the Reverend Seamus, uh, two weeks ago in Free Duff. Free Duff is actually essentially First Cully Hannah. Uh, Seamus came and preached uh, that Sunday evening uh, in Free Duff, and it was great to have him. Uh, you're very blessed to have Seamus as your minister. He's a great expositor of God's Word and brings a challenge uh, with it. Uh, and I trust you know the blessing of having such a, a good man. Uh, we were blessed to have him, and I want to put on public record my thanks to Seamus for inviting me into his pulpit and being here uh, tonight with you folks here in second and third Ruff Island. It's a, you can really go nowhere except somebody knows you. And I've spoke, spoken to one of the elders here already this evening who, who knew more about me than, than already let on. So I'll let you work out who that might be uh, and you can work that one out for yourselves. Again, it's great to be here, but we didn't come this evening just to, to have a good time. We came this evening specifically and intentionally to worship God. God calls us to worship from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Let us worship our creator God. Let's stand to sing our opening hymn of praise, all creatures of our God and King.
Please be seated. When we come to worship God, we are only joining with that which is already going on in heaven. Those who have left this earth, who have died in faith, brothers and sisters in Christ who are no longer with us, but are in heaven this evening through faith in Christ, this evening are in heaven, gathered around the throne and worshiping God, worshiping King Jesus. And we come together on earth as the church, and that call to worship is given, such as we are in now. This isn't just a, an ordinary meeting that we're in. This is not just a time of instruction. No, this evening we are gathering with the church already in heaven. We are gathering in by God's Spirit with those who are already worshiping King Jesus. What we're doing this evening is no light thing, no simple thing. It's a heavenly thing. It's, this is a divine hour. And so now we have sung praise to God, and now we're going to approach the Lord our God, who is seated on his throne in heaven. We're going to approach him in prayer. Let us bow our heads together. Good and gracious God, as we gather this evening, we're reminded afresh that you're the one who's given us all that we have and enjoy. You have lavishly poured out on us streams upon streams of your grace, warm homes, excesses of food, comfortable surroundings, Lord, even our ability to work comes from you. We enjoy so much. For so many of us, oh God, we are in need of nothing. Lord, we thank you this evening that you are a God who keeps his word. The scriptures remind us that while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And Lord, the scriptures are true. Early in the year, O oh God, we have prayed and asked for a spring to plant and to bring forth fresh growth, and we got it. We prayed for the summer sun to dry the land and grow the crops, to feed the animals, and we got that too. And now, O oh God, at this time we give thanks <coughs> for the harvest of all that you have promised and that you have provided. We we'll order God for that which is yet still to save, bless those who will gather it too. We come this evening, O God, with praise on our lips because you have given us so much. Despite only deserving your condemnation and judgment for our sin, for our rebellion against your holy rule and reign. You have chosen to show us mercy and grace. Thank you, God, this evening that we can come and sing of your amazing grace to us, seen in the cross. We praise you for sending your only Son for such of us, as us and for our salvation, for our forgiveness of our sins, that your wrath will be propitiated, and that we would enjoy the blessing of being made part of your family. In this time as we come, we gather, O oh God, with the church in heaven already around your throne to worship the name of your Son, our King and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh God, even this evening, to be prepared for that day which is yet still to come the great harvest of the world when Jesus shall return and gather up all those for whom he died. O oh God, make us mindful of that truth in your word that what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? Lord, amidst all the, the good and amidst all the good, Lord, and the and the wonderful things that you give us in this life. May we remember that there's more to life than worldly gain. 
Lord, refresh us this evening that true life, eternal life, is only found in Jesus. Lord, may this inspire us as we worship. May it focus our minds on on what you have done for us in Jesus. And may it stir us to even greater praise and obedience to Jesus our King. We pray this all for Jesus' sake. Amen. The choir are going to bring us uh, their next anthem, A Harvest Hymn. going to stand together now and join in the praise of Almighty God with our next hymn, For the Fruits of His Creation. Thanks be to God. Let's stand to sing.
please turn with me now in your Bibles. If you're using uh, the Pew Bible, the page number is 1045. I think the, the reading will be on the, on the screens for us. <coughs> That's coming up. Uh, my home church is Bally Watt. I'm a North Antrim boy uh, by nature. You maybe hear it in my accent. And uh, I was a dairy farmer by trade before I went into the ministry. I un- understand very well uh, the rural context and indeed even those uh, from a farming uh, community. Uh, and the, our passage this evening is one that's going to cut very deep. If in any way this evening your hope was in your herd of milk cows or how many acres of pretties you grow or indeed the size of your flock of sheep or that you, fa- you grow hundreds of acres of barley, whatever you think about that there, This is going to cut very, very deep. The Lord Jesus uh, was not uh, weak in how he spoke. He spoke straight, and he often spoke straight to the point. And this evening, we're going to see that in God's Word. Luke chapter 12, beginning to read at verse number 13. Jesus, at this point, is in the midst of his uh, preaching ministry. And it says in verse 13, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or or an arbiter between you? And he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of his and he told them this parable the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest he thought to himself what shall I do I have no place to store my crops then he said this is what I do I'll tell down, tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store my surplus grain and I say to myself You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. And who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Amen. (coughs) And we thank God for this, the reading of his word. Our offerings will now be received. Please stand. Our Heavenly Father, God, we have brought to you a portion this evening of what you have given to us. You have blessed us, O God, with so much. Lord, receive what we bring this evening. Lord, we pray that in your generosity towards us, Lord, that we will be generous, Lord, towards you. Lord, help us to give joyfully, to give as we have received. 
Lord, bless what we bring. Use it in the work of your kingdom, both in this place and in others. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to ask the choir now to bring to us uh, their second anthem, Every Heart Its Tribute Pays. Can I thank the choir for their hard work and preparation that they have put in uh, this evening. Thank you very much. If you have your Bibles there, please don't be afraid to open them now uh, and do keep them open as we look at this passage in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. In our passage this evening, the Lord Jesus tells a parable in which he condemns a rich fool who essentially builds big sheds in order to house his successful crop. I'm imagining that many of you are either from farms or have connections to farms. Uh, Rafferty is still quite a, a rural area, and if you're not from a farm or you don't have an immediate connection to a farm, you're not terribly far away uh, from a farm. And as well, you will know that in the farming world, sheds uh, and silo pits and cubicle houses and all the rest that goes along with farm yards are, are not getting any smaller. Things have moved on from the grape and the shovel. And I say thanks for that because I grew up doing a lot of graping, graping out, out buyers. And when I got my chance, I cowped the buyer and, and bought the sheds. Uh, farms are getting bigger. And if you don't move along with the times, you get left behind. And very quickly, like in all spheres of life, you can get left behind. And so the question that you may be thinking, is the Lord Jesus teaching that anyone who builds big sheds is simply guilty of being greedy? Is that what the Lord Jesus is saying in this passage? Is he saying that if you progress on and build bigger cubicle houses, Bigger parlors, bigger silo pits, concrete a bigger yard, that you're simply being greedy. Is it sinful to expand and grow your business in order to generate more income? Well, Jesus told this parable in response to a man who wanted Jesus to intervene in a family land dispute probably thinking, gosh, things haven't changed so much. 
this man who approaches Jesus seems to be fighting, well, he's fighting with his brother about who got what in the inheritance. And this brother, well, he's not too happy about his share. And to be blunt, he wants more, and he wants Jesus to do something about it. Now, it's not very familiar to us, but back in the day when Jesus was on this earth, God's people lived as a nation. <clears throat> and part of the laws that they had to uh, live under in order to be a nation, well, there were laws, God's laws for them were for the land too. God's law stated that the eldest brother should get two-thirds of the inheritance. Now, if you want to go and read about that, go to Deuteronomy 21. But this man comes to Jesus, and he's not interested in God's law. He knows God's law. There's no doubt about that. But he's not interested in it. In fact, he wants Jesus to overrule God's law in his favor. He wanted to get more of his father's inheritance than was due to him according to God. Even though God's law is very clear, two-thirds to the eldest son, this man is not happy. He's not satisfied with what God has given him. I think we can describe this man here. He's a jealous man, somewhat envious. He's the sort of man who complaining that life's not fair, you know. Look at all that I got. And he's sunk so low. Let's be very clear here. This man has sunk so low that he will try to screw over. He's going to try and screw over his own brother. He'll do anything to get more of the inheritance, even to the point of getting Jesus involved. The reality is that this man who comes to Jesus is driven by greed. His motives are simply sinful. He wants more no matter who he has to get it from. You know, isn't this the message we hear today from the world? <clears throat> greed is good. More is better. It's your purpose in life to have more. Um, the more you have, the better it will be, isn't it? That's what we're told every day. Have the best car. Have the fanciest house. Have the most extravagant holidays. Get to the top of the ladder in your workplace to get the greatest salary. Because the more you get, the happier you will be. You know, in fact, folks, we are educated in this. We're educated that the abundance of possessions and wealth will bring satisfaction and happiness. The motto is simple. Get more because this is where true life is found. And we're told that from when we're knee-high to a grasshopper until we go to the grave. That is the mantra in which we are surrounded. Now, please hear me very, very carefully because I don't want to be misunderstood. <clears throat> there is nothing wrong with any of those things that I have mentioned. You may be sitting here this evening and think, I just bought a new car three weeks ago. See, have, I am not having a dig at anyone who owns a new car. Maybe you've renovated the house. Not having a go at you for renovating the house or expanding your farm. <coughs> or, or even if you're here tonight, you, you have loads of assets. <coughs> That is not what Jesus is talking about. Wealth and possessions are not bad. Wealth and possessions are actually very good and they're necessary. Jesus is not condemning wealth, nor is he condemning possessions per se. But what Jesus is condemning is this. He's condemning those that think that possessions and wealth are the meaning of life. Jesus is condemning the thinking that true life is found in wealth and possessions. Jesus is saying to this fool who comes to him, look, there's more to life and stuff. If you have your Bibles there, look at verse 15. 
What does Jesus say? Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. True life is one where we know God and his salvation. And this is the very thing that Jesus is teaching this fool who comes to him with this parable. Jesus is telling this young man that the things of this world will not give you life, they won't save you. Look at verse 16. See what he says in the beginning of the parable. A rich young man's land has produced an abundance of crops. And he says, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. If you're a farmer this evening, <clears throat> it is not sinful to put up bigger sheds, to have more cows, to grow more spuds, to farm more land, or to buy another tractor. It is not sinful to increase your output. Far from it. As Christians, we are meant to be people who work and earn our way. And remember, the more you make lawfully, the more you can give on to the Lord. Remember that, folks. If you earn more, that means you can give more to the Lord and the work of his kingdom. To be clear, money is good. But what Jesus is getting at is this rich fool's motivation, his greed for more. This fool wanted more because he thought life was in having more. And through this parable, Jesus shows the folly of such thinking. Now look at the man that Jesus describes in this parable. Again, turn to me, turn with me in your Bibles. Look at the man he describes. First of all, there's three things about him. He's selfish. This man has no thought for anyone else, only himself. He's lonely. He has nobody else to talk to. His greed has left him on his own. Count how many times there in the parable the man says, I... He has so much wealth that he's lonely. His greed has left him by himself. But worst of all, this man's greed has left him hardened to God. Despite his bumper harvest, despite his massive uh, yield of crops, he does not thank God for what the Lord has prospered him. He believes he can do all things himself. Verse 19, I say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, for those who have no thought of God and all the things that God has prospered us with in this life, no thought of eternity, no, no thought of the judgment which is to come, this world and all it offers is all you have. It's no wonder that non-Christians strive after the things of this world because that's all they have to strive after. They have nothing else. Ecclesiastes 5 says these words of wisdom, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. You see, greed, greed is that insatiable desire for the things of this world. And greed is that thinking that if I have more of the things of this world, then I'll have life. But life is found in more. In many ways, greed is a marker of someone that doesn't know God and his salvation. That may seem quite strong, but it's true. If all you know is this world and all that it offers, well, then you don't know God and his salvation. Greed makes us believe that more of this world will give us true life, both now and in the future. And we see this with this rich man in the parable. This rich man actually believed 
that his wealth would, wouldn't only make him happy today, but he believed it would give him a future. He believed it would give him security for what was to come. And Jesus rebukes this thinking, verse 20, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? There are many ways in which wealth can help prepare for the future. Pensions, bank accounts for your children, they further their education, for instance. <clears throat> Buying your home, own home, that's a, that's a good use of wealth in, in preparing for the future. Expanding your business, perhaps. That's a good use of wealth in preparing for your future and, and that of your families. There's good and prudent and diligent ways to use the wealth that God has blessed us with. But the problem with this man who came to Jesus, and the man in this parable too, was that he saw his possessions and his wealth as his future. You know, wealth and material possessions can have a very toxic effect on people, including Christians, by the way. Often, the more we have the more time we spend protecting what we have. <clears throat> you can think about that. And, and so often, when our wealth and our financial possessions and all, all the many things that our wealth buys us, so often when that increases, instead of it being used as a blessing from God, we end up getting sucked in by the very thing that God has blessed us with. And very quickly, we can become a slave to it. And you know, ultimately, we can become blinkered into a thinking that our wealth gives us life. And that we need more of it. You know, in this parable, Jesus showed this man who came to him wanting more of the inheritance of the folly of such thinking. And Jesus ultimately shows us the folly of this thinking by reminding us of the reality of death. What happens to the, the rich man in this parable when he dies? What happens to the very thing which he has hoarded and strove for all his life? The very thing that he thought would provide him a future and provide him with security? Well, not only will the rich fool's wealth not save him from death and dying, but ironically, that thing which he put his hope in will be given away upon his death. His wealth means nothing for eternity. See, what Jesus is comparing here is the two positions of ever, either having riches in self or riches in God of being greedy for this world because your hope is in it, or being focused on God and the salvation that we have in Jesus. And that's the reality. There's two groups of people in this world. Those who strive for this world and this world alone because this world is all they have, or those who are focused on God and living for him and the salvation that we have in Jesus. And where we consider our treasure to be this evening actually acts as a barometer, a spiritual barometer of where we stand with God. I think when we read this parable in the church, we all nod in agreement, don't we? We read of this rich fool in the parable, this man who had it all, who coped his barns to build bigger ones, and who put his open his wealth, and we nod, and we say, foolish man. Foolish, foolish man. This man had no thought of what he needed for eternal life. And we nod in agreement, and we say, yeah. Fool. You know, folks, we preach our own beliefs and what we strive for in our day-to-day -day living. 
That might seem very simplistic, but it's largely true. Are you striving for eternal life with God? Or is your focus only on the things of this world? Striving for the things of this world. Greedy for more and more of this world. One of the saddest things that I have noticed in the church today is that many Christian parents fall into this trap of striving for the world. I'm sure this evening that many of you are parents. And many parents will, most parents in fact, will talk to their children and prepare them for a future in this world. They'll talk to their children about their careers, getting your exams, going to a good college or university or getting a good apprenticeship. And we'll, we'll talk about all those things. And they need to be talked about. And we'll maybe even come to the point of arguing with our children to get them to realize that they need to prepare in order to go out into the world and to make money. Seeing some parents nodding. Maybe you're having those conversations with your young people. But you know what saddens me is that parents don't talk with their children about being prepared for eternity. How foolish it is to prepare our children only for earthly treasures and yet neglect eternal life with God himself. I notice a few young people here this evening it's great to see you at church. Absolutely excellent. And I encourage you all to keep coming to church. Be, it, be in, in uh, the public worship of God each and every Lord's Day. And I see you look around and there's many of you young people in your, your different stages in uh, your school life. And some of you are younger and some of you are, are slightly older. And some of you have been making important decisions maybe at, at primary school or even into secondary school, and maybe some of you are even at college. And you're making decisions about your future. And I want to encourage you all, all you young people here, to work hard at your studies. It's important that you make plans and prepare for the future about what you're going to do with your life. It really is. It's so important. Work hard at school and at college or university or your apprenticeship or whatever it is you're going into. Work hard at it and prepare for your future. But I also want to say to you this evening, young people, don't forget to prepare for eternity. Do not fall into the trap that this world will give you life. Because it won't. Jesus said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Young people, No matter what you can earn in this world, it will not provide for your eternal life. Only God and the salvation that comes through his son, Jesus Christ, gives us true life. Again, can I say a word of warning to young people? This world will promise you many, many things. And it will tell you the more of this world you have, the better your life will be. God says, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? As we read this passage where Jesus is confronted by this man and Jesus uses a parable to confront the, the, the sinfulness of this man's attitude, we don't actually read of any response from the man who has come to Jesus arguing about the amount of land he receives. Did the man believe Jesus? Did he realize the folly of his greed would not provide for his eternal life? Did he repent and trust in God? We don't know. The passage actually doesn't tell us. We don't know how this man responded to Jesus. But this evening, each of us do know how we respond. Folks, are you striving after the things of this world? 
thinking that will give you life? Are you focused on Jesus and the eternal life which is to come? I trust this evening you see the foolishness of greed. Wealth and possessions are good. They're very good. And they should be used wise, wisely. But they'll never provide you with eternal life. I trust this evening that you see that the more of this world will only give you more of this world. And that's it. And nothing more. True life. Eternal life. Only comes through God and his salvation in Jesus. Praise God this evening that we have eternal life through Jesus, his son. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly God, our Father, we thank you for sending your son for our salvation. And we thank you, O God, for the many good things you have blessed us with in this life. Particularly this evening, O Lord, we thank you for the, for the harvest, for all the all the work that has been done throughout the farming year so far, O oh God, for all the, the silage that has been made, for all the crops that have been cut already and baled, Lord, for that which is still to be harvested. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. Heavenly Father, we think of the greater harvest yet to come, and we thank you for what Jesus has done for our eternal life. Lord, help us to trust in Jesus tonight, to be focused on tre in treasures in heaven rather than temporal possessions on earth. Focus our eyes afresh this evening. Let us see the glory and the greatness of your salvation in your Son. And we ask this for his glory alone. Amen. We're going to sing our closing hymn of praise. We plow the seeds and scatter the good seed on the land. Let's stand to sing. <coughs>
food that has been prepared from us, and then I will pronounce the benediction. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, for that which has been prepared for us, bless the hands that have made it. Bless us, Lord, as we receive it. And may, Lord, we eat it to your glory, and bless our fellowship too as we sit one with another. And now may grace, mercy, and peace from our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.